Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera. Salam Sabah Perdati Sabah Maju. A very good morning. I would like to invite to all of you to join our program uh, of this session. Uh, before we start, uh, I want to ask you how are you, how are your condition today? Is it good during this pandemic time? So I guess it, it's a very difficult time very difficult time for us to to go through all uh, the the hardness uh, i hope you'll be in a good term and enjoy our webinar session okay today uh, is a webinar session in collaboration malaysia productivity sabah branch and also v1 solutions in bahad would like to bring you one interesting topic on the exploring the future of technology farming. So before I start, let me briefly tell you what is the objective of our program today. First, you will uh, uh, explain to us the use of Internet of Things and it, its importance. Second thing, uh, the industry trend on farming, the smart farming that using aquaponic. You want to know more? Wait until being explained by our speaker. The fourth one is the aquaponic setup with IoT, cross industry in smart agriculture, and the last one, how to capitalizing on social media. Okay, that's somehow this the some of the objective of our program today. Uh, without any further ado, I would like to start. Uh, okay, before that, let me walk through uh, of our agenda today. We will start with the opening remarks by Encik Mozani Aris, uh, Director of Malaysia Productivity Corporation Sabah branch. And later on, we will start with the session one, topic one of the Smart Farming and Education Skill Training by Ms. Lydia Abe. She's a managing director of V1 Solutions in Bahad. The second session is on the title is the examining smart farming using the Internet of Things with Clean Agriculture by Mr. Eddie Lo, project director for V1 Solutions in Bahad. And the last part, we'll be having a QA session. Okay. Uh, to start our program, I would like to invite Inchit Mozaniaris to give his opening remarks. Please. Mr. Muzaniaris. Uh, thank you very much, the host. Okay, first of all, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera, salam sabah produktif, salam sabah maju. Uh, Miss Lida B, Managing Director of VI Solutions. Our distinguished speaker, and also Mr. Eddie Lowe, Project Director. And of course, uh, last but not least, my board member on board also, MPC board member, Mr. IR Daniel Lim, also with us today. Thank you very much, sir. And also, um, the members from the industry player, especially focus on the Sabah uh, key industry player on the agriculture side. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. <clears throat> it's a give, give, it gives me a good, uh, great pleasure to welcome all on board uh, for webinar session of export, uh, exploring the future of the technical uh, technology farming. Because nowadays we are talking about digitalization, we are talking about uh, more on the IoT side. So it's quite useful to those industries to embark, adopt, and adapt uh, the, the current opportunity to explore a new thing by venture up uh, technology. <clears throat> uh, this is the first collaboration between NPC and also VI Solution. Hopefully, after this, there will be more um, series of webinar that may assist or create a fruitful session to those industry players to enhance their competency, especially on the knowledge on OIT, uh, IoT, Internet of Things. For this workshop, we were brought to you the distinguished, uh, distinguished speaker, Mr. Lydia Bay. Managing Director and also Mr. Eddie Lowe, both of them have a vast experience, uh, 30 years experience in existing business. Ladies and gentlemen, the main objective or uh, the main objective of having this program is to encourage the industry player, especially in agriculture sites and tourism to embark uh, the use of the technology and also Internet of Things. Okay, based on the wawasan ataupun dasar 
also with the mission of the state government uh, melalui plan pembangunan Sabah Productive uh, Sabah Maju Jaya of course of course uh, even highlight strongly on the sector that may assist um, negeri Sabah to be more productive especially on the agriculture side the manufacturing and also under the tourism sector so uh, based on the current circumstances eh, uh, gdp of sabah on agriculture, uh, agriculture sector is shown decrease numbers from 13.7 billion in 2019 to 2.8 billion in 2020 therefore i strongly urge everyone of you to prepare yourself and embrace embrace the use of technology and agriculture and to help to boost back the gdp contribution for sabah especially uh, this i like uh, with the plan pembangunan uh, sabah maju jaya which is a plan smj 2021 2035 that was launched by the chief minister of sabah early this year involved three main uh, element or segment uh, on the agriculture part manufacturing tourism as i mentioned uh, just now and also human capital well-being and network infrastructure and also green sustainability ladies and gentlemen uh, to end my speeches I hope that everyone will benefit the sharing of the knowledge on the technology in farming, especially moving toward a smart farming that might be useful for us in business circumstances and scenario. Finally, I wish a fruitful day of interesting and beneficial program to all of you. Without, thank you very much for inviting us and also VI, thanks again for bringing us on board to collaborate with uh, your team. Thank you very much. Thank you, Encik Muzani Aris, for the opening remarks. So, um, without any further ado, I'd like to invite to all of you to on the video or to on your camera for a group photo. One, two, three. One more. One, two, three. Okay, last one. Freestyle. Freestyle, freestyle. Okay. One, two, three. Okay, thank you everyone. All right, let's start our session. Uh, thank you. Okay. So the first session, uh, the title is Smart Farming and Education Skill Training. This uh, uh, the sharing will be presented by Ms. Lydia Bay, Managing Director of V1 Solutions in Neighborhood. Let me briefly introduce Ms. Lydia Bay. Okay, this is some of uh, for Ms. Lydia Bay Bayo. She's the founder of Managing Director of V1 Solutions in Neighborhood. He's a passionate, hands-on entrepreneur, having founded and built several IT businesses around the region. He has lived and worked across Australia, Papua New Guinea, West and East Malaysia, and Vietnam, and enjoy bridging cross culture and geographies to create opportunities and share successes. Over the last 30 years, she has played a pivotal role in assisting business owners to transform their business, leveraging technology collaboration and national program to achieve sustainable growth, delivering more than 100 successful transformative IT projects in Malaysia, Brunei, and Vietnam. Her diverse experiences has crossed education, business, uh, education, banking, IT, agriculture, property and real estate, construction, manufacturing, distribution, and hospitality sectors. She had worked with a number of leading listed entities, including a top ASEAN bank and Mr. Niagara, a nation tech icon, before embarking on an entrepreneurship journey. Ms. Lydia Bay specialized in developing and nurturing long-term business relationships across multi geographies and ecosystems. Her expertise is in creating unique styling proportion that work in line with client strategies, training and opportunities optimized for the government initiative and industry 4.0 to boost productivity and growth. Okay, that's all about Ms. Lydia Bay. So, I guess we can start the session. Please, Media Levy. Good morning, Inje Mokzani, Pengarah of MPC, ladies and gentlemen, 
A very good morning and welcome to our first online webinar in year 2021. And also thank you to you, Inche Fajri, for your kind introduction. Today, what I wish to achieve with you is to take stock and have a quick relook at what has impacted us in year 2020 and also looking at the rebound in year 2021. How it is important that businesses can be prepared for the future and hopefully for the next normal. Hopefully, I would like to leave behind three key takeaways for your considerations. Well, in year 2020, it is a year that everything changed due to COVID-19. Business shut down, people lost their jobs, people took pay cuts. It is impacted on our public health. We are learning how to work and learn remotely with our colleagues and our loved ones. Our lifestyle changed tremendously. Many businesses have adopted new ways of doing their business and serving their customer. I would like you to take a look of the chart above. In year 2020, the world changed. All economies are disrupted globally. The statistic taken from the above recently illustrated United States, Eurozone, Japan, China took a big dip deep valley in year 2020. At the same time, China rebounds above in general and above the world average. Ladies and gentlemen, more importantly, are we ready for the recovery and future? This slide show you to be prepared for the future, let's take us a tour at the ninth pillar of technological advancement and our government captioned it as IR 4.0. To prepare ourselves for driving force of change, we should be ready in particular on technology development and advancement, globalization of workforce, face the disrupted economy locally and globally, and also automation of business process. This slide shows us the government initiative our future lies in reinventing our business. So ladies and gentlemen, do you have a new business model and all the capability for the future? Do you have access to the knowledge, skills, technology and a partner to handhold you and empower you in this journey? Ladies and gentlemen, we at V1 are going to focus on smart farming for urban farmers and education and skills training for our community at a very low cost. Our objective in smart farming for urban farmer is to increase awareness about urban farming increase accessibility to affordable, healthy, fresh product, provide a unique opportunity 
for communities to learn about nutrition and how to grow food. This slide show you the common methods in urban farming. My colleague, Mr. Eddie Lowe, will share more information in his speech just later. He will share more details in vertical farming, hydrophonics, and aquaphonics. In Sabah and V1, we are in a mode and would like to adopt a mindset of giving back to our community through special projects in smart farming and education and skill training. I'm happy to announce the launching of V1 e-university where you can learn anytime, anywhere, any place with your mobile devices with the latest material presented digitally. We have more than 5,000 online courses, more than 100,000 of video learning, more than 100 million ebooks, journals, and articles. To sum up, I would like to leave behind three key takes away today. One, as we move on in year 2021, we must still be prepared for continued uncertainty. Take the collaborative and creative approach with our partners and our customers and stakeholders. Point number two, everything starts with our customers and shareholders. Make it their way of thinking and doing is also our way of thinking and support them to create their success stories. Point number three, place digital at the heart of your strategy. Use technology both tactically and strategically. In a nutshell, we must be responsive to our partners, customers, stakeholders. That is all coming from me and I wish you all a productive morning. Now, I would like to hand over to our moderator, Inche Fatsuri. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lydia Bey, for the informative input just now. So, uh, let's move to the next agenda. In agenda, we'll be having uh, some interactive survey game. I'd like to invite all of you to scan the QR code. We have some game. Lah. So once you scan the QR code, we will be a survey. I want you to answer the survey. It's a, just a simple survey. And then we'll be presenting the result or the statistic. Please, you can uh, scan the QR code or you can go into www.menti.com. We will have around one minute, one to two minutes to get the statistic of the result. Yeah, that's the statistic. So the indicator is time, money and effort. How many time, money and effort you put, is, is it you put, you prioritize for yourself, your family or your career? So the statistic shows, okay, still moving. It's not finalized. 
just gave around 30 seconds. Still moving. Hmm. All right. Still moving. Okay. So I guess. Uh, oh, still moving. <laughs> All right. So most of you uh, says that you pra will practice on their family. Uh, Seventy-four point seven percent. Uh, second one, you focus on the career, 71.2. The last one, is what we call less prioritized, is on the self, 70.5%. Okay. Okay, let's move to the next game. This is the next statistic. Choose one area that you want to change right now. To be more successful. Let's move. Hmm. Finance, healthy, spiritual, education, and family. Let's see what will be number one. So I guess during this pandemic time, most of you will be focused on the finance. How about education? No one vote for education. Issues here, zero. No one vote for education. Yeah, at least 3% uh, uh, vote for spiritual. Lah. It's good. Lah. You have need to balance your spiritual and also your lifestyle. Eh? Okay, the last, okay. We're still moving. The second last being prioritized is on family. Okay, lah. Uh, so let's move forward. So as I can see here, most of you will be focused on the finance. Finance lah. During this pandemic time, most of you will focus how to get money, how to gain money, how to get extra wage, how to get extra pay. Uh, that thing is, I mean, yeah, obviously. Uh, second one is on health, okay? Wow. After I said uh, no one uh, focus on spiritual, uh, uh, is moving to three and then the last one is education okay all right thank you for your vote let's move to the, let's move to the next agenda the next agenda will be on the presentation by mr eddie Lowe. with the topic of examining smart farming using the internet of things with clean agriculture but before that let me read some of his bio mr eddie is a project director for v1 solutions in Rambahad, has more than 30 years of working experience in software solution business performance improvement and supply chain management serving mainly education establishment bug port fmcg and general manufacturing industries his key of expertise include development of it strategy blueprint enterprise risk management, business process improvement on behalf of his clients. Mr. Eddie has formally attached to two of big four and heads of management consulting and risk consulting team. He's also experienced in areas of providing advisory service on mobility solutions such as barcoding, RFID with improvement in operational processes with emphasis on in core activities such as ERP, enterprise resource planning, Salesforce automation, warehouse management, and also asset tracking and traceability. Okay, that's all the bio of Mr. Eddie. So I guess Mr. Eddie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Encik Pazri. Uh, Encik Mokzani Aris, good morning. Puan Pengarah Malaysia Productivity Centre Sabah, Miss Lydia Bay, 
Managing Director of V1 Solutions, Sundram Brahat. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, selamat pagi. Now, uh, what I'm going to do is to show you all a bit of my slides with regards to how you can actually uh, connect technology in, via IoT with regards to smart farming. So um, what I'm going to do is to show you a screen of what I have down here. And uh, I'll take it through to what I have, right? So this is the title that I have today, Examining Smart Farming Using IoT with Clean Agriculture. This is basically an awareness uh, session. Uh, hopefully that you all can take it further from there through a discussion with V1 Solutions. What I'm going to do is that, right, I'm going to cover a few of these areas over here. And basically what you're going to do is to put in a little bit of awareness and what you can actually do to make Sabah a much better place in terms of smart farming. Now, uh, an IoT, uh, IoT actually started a long time ago, right? So before 2005, the internet was basically used uh, with regards to the connectivity uh, in industries such as the uh, uh, the, the, the transportation industry, as well as the energy and utilities industry. The reason why they need it is because they need almost a real-time data to be sent back to their data centers. So that was before 2005. And before 2005, you will roughly know that the, the advent of uh, or the starting of use of the internet was way back in the 1990s. So as we move on to today, the internet is an everyday thing and is already part of our life. And the thing down here is that uh, if you look at your mobile phone, you find that there's so much connectivity to so much information, right? And what it does is that slowly he has also embedded things like artificial intelligence into your mobile phone to, in order to have us people or human beings make better decisions. So if you have all this together, you'll find that a lot of things in IoT today can just be summed up to just one single statement. Anything that can be connected will be connected, right? That is IoT in a nutshell. So moving towards 2025, which is only a few years uh, away, you'll find that IoT is part and parcel of the entire network using clouds. Uh, as one of the distribution networks across to everybody in the world. So uh, IoT is no longer a buzzword that's been used a few years ago, but it's something that uh, it is part of us without us realizing it. So that's IoT in a nutshell. Now, there are a lot of industries that have benefited from IoT. Uh, one of them will be, of course, the public sector, where the government rel uh, rely on the internet as well as uh, data to ensure good governance, to support that in good governance. The banks or the financial institution uses that, obviously, right? So otherwise, uh, internet banking will be something that is going to be very difficult. Healthcare uh, is also one of the areas that is also uh, embracing uh, IoT. Retail, manufacturing, real estate, logistics, as well as agriculture. But the only thing down here that uh, what we can see is that while the most important things that what you see down here is that you find that the industries that are benefiting from IoT, but what is more important on this particular slide are the connectivity to all of it down here. And that is where data is being transmitted across all to ensure that whoever is within any of this industry, all right, makes use of the information for better decision making for better business strategies and moving forward itself for better healthcare and for better living. So what happens down here is that the industry trends in farming, in farming or in agriculture, the standard thing is that the traditional way of how we everything is that we need to raise our production yield. And the fact down here is that an increase in production gives a healthy return to the farmers. So in other words, what you're saying is that the more, the better. The more hectares of land I have, the more that I can actually plant and better the returns. 
They are also thinking in the agriculture sector whereby uh, people look into a diversification of agriculture. So if you take a look at the economy, the economy is actually moving. If you compare the economy in Malaysia or anywhere in the world, 30 years ago, or even 50 years ago, right? The advancement of economy and green choices have provided an extension in the improvement of agriculture. So what does it do down here? It actually gives farmers or planters an opportunity to diversify, to move away from just whatever they've been doing for the past 50 years to something different, right? It's the food for thought down here. And I believe that the farming industry has been giving this thought for a long time throughout the decades. One of the things also is that the trend in horticultural outputs. Horticultural outputs as compared to traditional farming has taken a back seat throughout all these years, right? So if you take a look at it, atmosphere, soil qualities, what it does is that it empowers farmers to grow a huge assortment of agricultural plants, including organic and aquaponic plants. Now, the fact down here is that if you take a look at the game just now that you played, one of the highest ranking down here is that family is of utmost importance to everybody. All right. And with family comes health. And in health comes the way of how we consume our products down here. So let's take this particular thought and let's move it towards the back of how we can actually increase the health of all of us via uh, this particular uh, way of how we approach towards horticultural farming. Exports is one of the areas down here itself, whereby if you know that there is an increase in people moving from small towns over to, to large cities, to metropolitan uh, cities and so on. So what it does is that it gives added pressure in terms of ensuring that there are more and more production and the more and more uh, areas where we can actually have a choice in selecting the kind of uh, uh, fresh produce that we can actually consume. But along the way comes the millennials. The millennials are totally different in their mindset and in their thinking process as compared to the Gen X and even the Gen Y for that matter. The millennials are a lot more concerned with regards to eco-sustainability. They are concerned with things like how do we actually give back to Mother Earth in the areas that we have actually harvested or the jungles that we have actually uh, uh, removed and then replaced with agriculture. So millennials is in such a way that, um, well, we are for Mother Earth, we are for greens, all right? We are for the preservation of our country and our land and so on. How do we approach this when this goes, in, uh, goes against what we have on the first line down here, which is the more, the better. So we have to sit down and start giving it a deep thought about how we can actually approach this while satisfying our future customers, meaning the millennials. So what is the deal with the farmers, the consumers and the technology? Farmers, for anyone who have actually been doing farming, Farming is something that is extremely difficult, it's laborious, and especially in our tropical climate, under the hot sun, it is by far means one of the most difficult uh, job that anyone can do. And I take my hats off to all the farmers across the world. The second thing is the mindset is that technology adoption in agriculture business can be expensive. Five years ago, if you were to tell me that technology adoption in farming is expensive, I would totally agree with you. But today is totally different. The approach is different. How we actually talk to a farming community, how we actually talk to the agricultural company itself in terms of adopting, uh, adoption of technology is different. And that's the reason why blueprints, technology blueprints are very, very important to actually face up the kind of technology adoption that you need based on your business strategies. So high cost, of techno high cost of technology adoption is a question mark now. The other thing that farmers are thinking is that labor reskilling is difficult. Farmers, being them, right? Now, knowing that they only know how to actually till the land, sometimes moving them from tilling the land to something else can be a little bit of a challenge down here. So, uh, and what more to actually uh, use their labor and telling them to do things in a different way. 
it can be a little bit challenging and sometimes the plants and the paddy and the, and, and the trees or whatsoever so there's no weight for you to ensure you're fully skilled in order to tell uh, to tend to it number four growing a trend in local employment resulting in engagement of foreign labors any anywhere in the world not just sabah alone if you find even in peninsula malaysia you find that there are a lot of uh, of the farming industry uh, engaging in foreign labors and the reason why they do that is because of this particular thing that is in their mind which is the more the better the more the better so what happens down here is that the bigger the plant the bigger the the the, the farms that they have the more people that they need in order to tend to it, right? And number five, exposure to alternative farming methods is considered as very unprofitable. This is not just in Malaysia. This is basically happening in even North America, the United States and Canada, and even parts of Europe. Alternative farming is considered unprofitable. So therefore, things such as horticultural, aquaponics is considered, a, will take a backseat as compared to traditional farming. But if you move over on the right side, the consumers, the millennials, what do all of us want as millennials? Well, for me, I am from the Gen X uh, era, and I'm sure that there is a mix of Gen X, Gen Y, and even millennials uh, in this particular uh, webinar. All of us, having said that itself, we look towards healthy living. We want healthy living, right? And the thing down here is that we are also concerned with the amount of chemicals and pesticides and the kind of fertilizers that we use on the fresh produce that we actually uh, have on the uh, on the fresh produce that we actually buy from the market, whether it is from the supermarket, whether it's going to be from the wet market or tamu for that matter itself. At the back of our mind, we are always thinking, do I need to wash my vegetables so much so all right, that we actually get rid of all the chemicals and pesticides? And one of the things in agriculture is that uh, today, uh, people or millennials right, right, have the rights to know the origins of your fresh produce. From wherever in Peninsula Malaysia, where we think of now is that when we think about buying vegetables, the first thing we look towards to is that vegetables have to come from Cameron Highlands. That is the de facto place where we get our vegetables from. However, the only thing down here is that if I were to transfer this over to Sabah, right? Where is the origins of produce coming from? They come from all over the place. It's because Sabah is such a large state down here, right? It is advantageous for people to actually take advantage of the land down here to start in farming. Now, the thing down here is that while you are actually, it's actually good to know where the origin is produced and the reason why is because if there's any outbreak of, say, a bacteria or whatsoever itself, we can actually trace it back. The traceability is one of the most important things, right, to know where the produce comes from. So the only thing that we can find out on the origins of produce is basically from the label or the sticker that you find on the packet of the vegetables that you purchase from the supermarket. However, if you were to go to the wet market, there will never be any, uh, there will be any information if, with regards to where the produce comes from. And you will just have to depend on the seller to tell you where it comes from. And in most cases, they won't even know themselves because they will take it from the suppliers and the suppliers will probably take it from the wholesalers and so on and so forth. So uh, moving forward down here, Natural resources is, of course, a concern for consumers so like what I have in my previous slide. People are concerned with the depletion of it. And lastly, itself, all of us, all of us, young and old, we look towards clean air. It is a right for us to have, we breathe in clean and fresh air. We want natural resources around us. And at the end of it, what is, there's nothing else that matters than just for us to live in a non-toxic environment. So ladies and gentlemen, if you remember, if you were to drive uh, in, in a highway or in the countryside itself, sometimes when you wind down the window, you will find that you can smell fertilizers, all right? So um, how do we actually approach this when it comes to today's uh, consumers looking towards healthy living? Now, this is, uh, let me take you away from this. So let me take you from, 
from there to a magazine called Vogan Magazine. And it was done by this particular reporter called Isabella uh, back in November 2020. What it says down here is that she has indeed interviewed someone from the Malaysian government. And they find that Malaysia has chosen to implement smart agriculture through IoT. So what does it do down here? IoT, right, and the Malaysian government is convinced that it will boost the productions, the operations for rural farmers in a lot of ways. And at the same time, it takes back real-time data. And in this real-time data, they are able to avoid the risk of crop failure, increasing crop production, all right, minimizing fertilizer usage and water consumption. And what it does down here is that you decrease the cost of production and increasing for, uh, profitability and, system, and sustainable practices. So this is well and good when it comes to between the government and also the farmers. But on the other hand itself, what are we looking for deep inside down here? Basically, at the end of it itself, we want to address and eliminate extreme poverty and establish growth and equity among the farming community. In Malaysia, there are a lot of people in the northern part of peninsular Malaysia, all right, southern part of Johor, which is, which is pineapple uh, industries and so on, East Malaysia and so on, all right? All of them, all right, look towards uh, eliminating poverty down here, okay? And the worst thing down here in back in 2020, in the beginning of March 2020, right up to date itself, what is worse down, what has made it worse down here is that we are going through, a, we are going through a pandemic, uh, uh, I would say era, okay, whereby even, even for that matter itself, suppliers for uh, vegetable, fresh produce itself is unable to transport their vegetables over from, uh, say, Cameron Highlands, even downtown to Klang Valley or in KL for that matter. So what it, is, what it does is extremely damaging to not just the uh, farmers alone, it is also tweaking or uh, rather tilting the economic balances between how we consume, right? And, and the consumer itself is unable to actually get uh, fresh produce from their own uh, country. In peninsula, in peninsula Malaysia, one of the things that we can actually do down here is that, well, if we cannot get uh, fresh produce from Cameron Highland or vegetables from Cameron Highlands, we can always get it imported from China or Australia. So what does it mean down here? It means down here is that we have an outflow right, of the GDP over to other countries. So we have to really look into all this, uh, uh, this, kind, uh, this, this area, the scenarios down here, in order to come up with something which is a little bit smarter. We have to be a little bit smarter in terms of overcoming in what we call a, a pandemic uh, era, and also to ensure that we have a healthy lifestyle, healthy living, right and healthy consumption of food so the last part down here is that malaysia is just focusing on full shift of extensive farming to an environmentally and socially unsustainable intensive farming system but what i can actually do down here is that it's not really exactly a full shift but what we want to do down here is to complement the traditional farming with something a little bit better right so in order to do this technology comes into play whether we like it or not, technology will be dragged, shouting and screaming towards the front door itself, all right, to be part and parcel of our life. Taking into consideration example, the supply chain in terms of transporting your lunches and even your, your bubble tea or whatsoever so to you in your home, all right, is something that have actually cropped up within the past one and a half years ago. So that to me, with the use of just your mobile phone, you're able to actually order food for yourself, for your family, with the use of technology. So how fantastic can that be? And because of the pandemic itself, it has actually pushed Malaysians, it has pushed people in, in their Southeast Asia itself to come up with something a lot more innovative, all right? And a simple thing such as delivery of food itself is, in, is considered one of the success stories in Malaysia. So, how do we complement traditional farming with clean farming? Take a look at this. On the left-hand side down here, with traditional farming, all right, the farms produce vegetables. Fresh produce down here changes the climate. 
technically what it does is that we actually replace our jungle all right our flora and fauna with uh with uh, plantations all right or farms for that matter itself the second down here is that we have a population boom in malaysia we definitely have a population boom i remember when i was actually doing my commerce uh, subject back in secondary school our population back in the 1970s is only 12 million today they are 32 million or uh, 33 million for the matter itself excluding all foreigners who has been living in malaysia for so long so there is definitely a population boom and in a population boom down here we need to increase in the food production right and uh, like what I've mentioned before, and because of population boom, a lot of young people, once they have completed their studies, they prefer to move from the countryside over to uh, city living. And there is an increase in urbanization, metropolitan become bigger, and every single town in Malaysia, or even Sabah, Sarawak, the capital becomes a, what we call a city. So with more people staying in a uh, more compact, area obviously you can't run away from pollution and with pollution itself comes with all kinds of sickness all right you have flu you have cough you have you have uh, you know in today if you were to cram in a particular place where you stay and chances that if you're working in a very unhealthy environment chances that you may catch the dreaded uh virus virus that's currently going around now so Back to this down here, if I want to move into clean farming or smart farming for the matter, how does, how, what am I supposed to do? I can always put up an aquaphonics farm and leave it as it is. No problem to that itself. But you'll find that managing this, uh, managing aquaphonics or hydroponics itself can be also equally, uh, equally stressful for the farmers. Number one, because it is something which is new to them. Definitely granted that it will take time for them to get used to it. The second thing down here is a, it's a different method of how we actually tend to the fresh produce. So why, why can't we just take a step back and think about how technology can assist in the management of, the, uh, of smart farming? Don't worry about the graph down here, but what I'm trying to show down here is a forecasted market value in hydroponics and aquaponics. And you notice the trend is moving upwards between 2016 to 2025 for hydroponics, 2017 to 2022 in aquaponics. The trend is moving up. It is not going down, right? Next thing. So what happens down here is that if you see it in a market overview, the global aquaponics market is estimated to register a compound annual growth rate of 12.5% between this year and the next five years later. Having said that, having said that itself, the largest share in aquaponics market is basically in North America, meaning the United States as well as Canada. All right. While they have actually been been uh while they have taken large share in terms of this particular industry, there has not been much research that's been done in terms of business profitability or the commercial viability in terms of aquaponics, all right? So why is it it's not done? It's because like what I have mentioned in my previous slides, smart farming or rather aquaponics uh, and hydroponics itself without technology, all right, takes a backseat as compared to traditional farming. Right, it takes a way back seat that you can find. If you can actually find a bus, it probably be sitting at the back seat of a bus. Uh, the next thing down here is that when we move down back to Malaysia, Malaysian business scene is much more focused is that in that the aquaponics and the hydroponics industry is that uh, it is very much focused on the supplier side. And usually what it does down here is that aquaponics is just set up at the back of your, your own home. It's like a, something that you use it as a hobby. So uh, today, young entrepreneurs are looking into aquaponics as an alternative income. It is never a main income for them. It is an alternative income. So again, when it comes to business, when it comes to making money, all right, again, it takes a back seat. But take a look at this. This particular report came about all right, 
in back in December 2019 itself, Kundan Sang, all right? Farmers are actually experimenting via the guidance of the Prasatuan Pladang Kinabalu, all right? They have gone into upper phonics and hydroponics since 2019. Again, without technology, all right? Now, they have actually been given a, a piece of short, a small, a small piece of land down here itself with a capital uh, funding of 85,000 ringgit. 85,000 ringgit. The capital funding, of course, will be dispersed at as and when that's needed. But however, the success down here, when they actually calculate back the total cost down here itself, 85,000 ringgit has been spent on capital expenditure. And the best thing from it down here itself, the farmers are getting a monthly sales of 5,600 to 6,000 ringgit a month. A month. Meaning to say that in one and a half year, even less than that, if you do your math properly itself, the entire capital expenditure that's been spent on this particular project itself has been uh, has been re uh, recouped, and the rest of this is basically used for your operating operational uh, expenditure as well as your profit. So again, this is the experiment, all right. But what is it that is making these people, all right, these young entrepreneur farmers itself, trying to sort of increase or in fact. Uh, ensuring that uh, this particular industry in terms of aquaponics gets bigger. One of the things down here is that, and I am not afraid to say this itself, being Asians for that matter itself, all right, we tend to look into, have, we tend to have, ask these questions, have anyone else besides us have done it and how successful are they? So we always have to look into other people to find out whether or not they have done it and whether they are successful. If there's no one have done it, uh, the, we, will, we probably not want to take the risk down here itself. We take a step back and go back into something which in our comfort zone, that is traditional farming. Again, this is something that we need to review in terms of our thought process itself. We need to have a small little paradigm shift in terms of looking into wow, how we can actually make uh, uh, farming smarter. So components of aquaphonics is pretty straightforward itself. If you find, if you find that uh, aquaphonics is divided into two components, one is the plant, uh, are the vegetables that's been planted down here itself. The other one will be the fishes. All right, the fisheries that you can actually put, you can put prawns if you want to, all right? You can put fishes, you can put uh, tilapia if you want to, all right? And what happens down here is that both vegetables and the fishes works hand in hand, all right? So what happens down here is that there will be a pump, all right? Traditionally, there will be a pump to have the air uh, oxygen or air for the fishes down here itself. The fish will eat the, the uh uh, the food that you give it to them itself, they will produce waste. The waste again will be pumped up and will be filtered up as fertilizers for your vegetable. And this will continue to go, uh, go on and on. Vegetables, from what I understand, is that from the point that you actually started planting it, it takes about between three to four weeks to reach maturity. And the fact down here itself, uh, harvesting time is basically every four, four weeks. So, but then the fish is there for you to actually continue using it. You can sell it, you can replenish it, and so on and so forth. So it all depends on the uh, the skill sets or rather the farmers' uh, uh, processes or procedures and how they can actually uh, take vegetables as well as fish and rotate it all over the place. So in terms in terms of IoT down here, if you take a lot of this little little stopwatch down here. Basically, what we want to do is that we want to do a lot of reading by the seconds or by the minutes. Remember what we talk about the utility and also the transportation industry, the flight industry and so on. Data reading by the seconds and minutes is utmost important to them to ensure that they know their flight schedule, their speed, the, the weather uh, conditions and so on and so forth. So likewise, what we do is that the sensors are being used to measure, all right? the pH of the water itself, the alkalinity of the water, the waste, ensuring that the pump is used, the amount of water that is pumped for the vegetables, and so on. And then what it does down here is that it actually automatically, the mechanisms will automatically be running. It either stop 
or you either run depending on what's been set down here and depends on the data that's been read by the sensors down here itself. And along the way itself, if assuming that there is a change in the weather, for instance, uh, there's going to be rain and the weather, the temperature have actually gone down itself, automated corrective measures has been set in and work in tandemly together with the sensors and the actuators. All this information, again, will be transferred over to the farm manager. The farm manager actually manages the uh, aquaponics farm from anywhere. Back in his house, 500 kilometers away, it does not matter. But the management becomes so, uh, I would say, it would say simple. But the fact down here is that manager is aware of what's going on 24 by 7. So that if in the event, if there's anything that he needs to do, he will then be able to actually instruct or information can be sent to his staff or supervisors, right? To go and supervise or to, to do corrective uh, corrective uh, improvement in the aquaponics farm down here. So how fantastic can that be itself? So wherever you are, wherever that you do down here itself, information is being transferred to you. That is the power of IoT. Now, while we can have all the sensors, we have the actuators, we have clean farming, we have the technology itself, but one of the more important down here is of course the support, right? From the state and the federal government, uh, federal agencies down here. Ms. Lydia Bay have actually put up a, a budget uh, slide down here itself, but government have actually allocated 260 million, 260 million ringgit for the ag agricultural uh, industry down here itself. And the thing down here is that the money is being utilized in the event, the money will be actually transferred to you if you to embrace IR 4.0, if you were to embrace aquaculture, if you were to embrace IoT, and a part of the money itself is also being allocated to the farming community or they call it community, all right? So with the support of the federal government, with technology under V1 solutions, with our mindset to say that we want to move towards clean farming because we want healthier air, we want healthier uh, uh, consumption of food, and in the end resulting in healthier and happier family members and so on. I, 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 do, I can't think of any other things that will actually take us back to say that, uh, no, we're not gonna do this. So in the event that let us take a step forward, and if you were to do that itself, we have three different sets of uh, setting up itself. Uh, we call it the Yugo, Humi, and Davy. And looking by the picture down here, you find that Davy, uh, Davy's uh, setup project itself will uh, depend on the size of the, the place that you want to use. Uh, one of the things down here is that in, in uh, aquaponic itself, you do not necessarily need a huge place, as, uh, huge space as compared to traditional farming. But let us uh, approach us, talk to us itself and see how we can actually assist you in that particular manner. Whether you should go for a Davy, you should go for a Humi, or you go for a Yugo project, right? So again, uh, let me re re rephrase what we have down here itself. The left areas are the, are the hardware that's being used in uh, smart farming, okay? We have monitors, actuators, and sensors. On the right-hand side itself, data is being transferred to your mobile devices. Mobile devices is something that is good and well when it comes to farm management itself. But how can we use this as part of data analytics, as part of business intelligence? That is when you actually transfer the information over in what we call an enterprise resource planning, together with some of the complementary software that you need in order to ensure a successful agricultural farming that you have in your area, all right? And all this is well, and I always believe that when you actually do this itself, there are three core components, the people, the processes, and the technology. We have all three components down here. So knowledge experts, knowledge partners is of course essential to ensure that the farmers, all right? What they do is that they're gonna be very, very hesitant in terms of touching even a tablet for the matter itself. It's up to us to hold their hands and take a step forward in terms of embracing IoT. This is our role, this is our responsibility. At the end of the day, what do we want? We want someone like the farmers itself who's able to actually absorb the kind of skill sets that we provide them using the hardware over here itself 
and for them to be successful. And when they are successful, right, they will be happy. And if I were to multiply a number of happy farmers across, say, Kundasang for the matter itself, what makes you think, right, that Kundasang will, will, will be, okay, the, what we call the valley of how fresh produce can come about? When someone says, I want fresh produce, the first thing that in the mind comes about is Kundasang. For example, right, it gives solid reputation for the people over there, be it in a farming community or in other industries within that area. Now, this, what, this is a slide that I have drawn in such a way that I have lines all over the place, right? The reason why I have this over here is important because we are not just focusing on smart farming alone. I want far smart farming itself to have it across industries towards all the other areas, all right? For example, in tourism, hotels and lodging facilities with intelligent planting for fresh produce for guests and own personnel. How fantastic can you be if you have hotels, all right, having a set of uh, uh, aquaphonics farm or their rooftop or parking lot for that matter. Now, when a guest comes in, a hotel guest comes in and say that I want to have fresh salad, how fresh can you be? Can you just take a lift up to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the rooftop itself, plug it in, wash it off, present it to the guest? How fresh can you be? And I can tell you this is not something, this is not something on piece of paper. This has been considered a success in two of the hotels in Singapore. Singapore has moved ahead when it comes to uh, uh, fresh farming. All right. So I don't see I don't see this as something which is a disadvantage down here in terms of the tourism for Sabah for that matter itself, but it's something for you to think about. Now, for hoteliers, one of the back of the mind is that they will be thinking, look, I am good in managing hotels. I am good in taking our guests over to visit different, different places in Sabah, right? Scenic places and so on and so forth. But I'm not really that well versed when it comes to smart uh, farming. The fact down here is that let's take it one step further for talents. Take it one step further. Why don't you actually outsource the management of the aquaphonics over to a, 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 a farmer? All right. A farmer will be able to actually manage this using IoT from wherever he is. And if there is a need down here to send one of his staff over to assist in uh, operational matters within there. And all all in it down here itself, this particular uh, aquaphonics farm is just probably 100 meters away from, the, from your hotel guests. That's the thing that we have to think about, all right? That's the thing that hotelers will have to look into. Look, what can we do for our guests to make it one step over our competitors, right? And this is one way. And for some of the hotelers, they say that, look, I'm not really comfortable with having uh, a, a, a smart farm in my this, uh, in my in my building itself. Is there any way that we can actually look into itself? One of the things you can actually do, while ensuring that guests have the fresh produce down here, is what we call to adopt a farm. You can actually adopt a farm. You can actually have an arrangement with a particular farm down here itself in terms of transporting fresh uh, guard, uh fresh produce over to your hotel at a particular time and so on and so forth. And what does it do down here when you do an outsourcing uh, an adoption uh, uh, approach down here? You basically you basically open up in what we call a mini supply chain or a small scale supply chain, transporting fresh produce over to uh, wherever it is, where hotels, all right, or even to mini markets or even people who wants to specialize in selling fresh produce. So a supply chain down here, a small little supply chain uh, industry can be actually set up. And the best thing down here itself, it provides work, right, for people who have actually lost their, their jobs uh, because of this uh, particular pandemic. It is something small, all right, not necessarily big. So, but let's take a step forward. Let me encourage you all to take a step forward, all right, in order to take just smart farming alone into tourism and in also to open up the supply chain industry. So, good and well when it comes to all this, right? 
Now, I want to find out to see whether I can actually market this. And I want these success stories to be known to a lot of people in the world, all right, or anywhere. What's the best thing that we can actually do is to utilize what the millennials has been using down here itself, which is social media. Social media to us is not just about putting our family photos, the kind of food that we eat and take photographs here and there, all right, or putting videos of uh, certain things that you have seen over in the social media. What they can actually do down here is to use social media, take advantage of the power of technology, of IoT itself, all right, to promote clean farming and intelligent planting and to move it as a catalyst to promote Sabah as the de facto state for environmental farming. The word down here is environmental farming. All right. So another way of how we can actually use to actually boost uh, smart farming down here itself, say, hey, going to supermarkets today is basically a risk because there's so many people going in and out down here. I don't want to catch anything that will affect my health down here, but I still have this urge about going into a supermarket. I want to walk along the aisles. I want to actually look at what are the kind of products that is being sold or being displayed on the shelf, all right? Whether it's at eye level or the bottom and so on. I want to know what are the promotions and so on. I want to walk. So what happens down here is that for us, we are going to set up a virtual mall, a virtual mall that looks exactly like a supermarket down here with a lot more intelligence put into it because you will not just be walking and looking around for searching for something if you're in a hurry, but they can actually pinpoint the places that you can walk along the aisle down here, look into something that you like down here, put it into your cart, pay it at the, pay it at the counter down there using your e-wallet. How fantastic can you be? You can walk along virtually itself, right? You have fresh produce being placed down there or any other, any other people who want to sell their products in the virtual mall, all right? So this is extremely, this is a very, very, I would say, uh, important slide that have actually come up across itself. Of course, there'll be a lot of other ideas and we welcome ideas, uh, come and talk to us and see how we can actually take advantage of IoT in your particular business or industry. So at the end of this down here itself, now if every hotel, if let's say even half the number of hotels in Sabah is, it embraces smart farming, putting fresh produce in their area. Supply chain automatically comes up, right? Social media is something that we can it come comes up down here itself. So social media not just depends on the hotel's website, Facebook, Instagram, or for the matter itself. It's very much a reactive way of how you can actually make your hotel known or the kind of activities or projects that you are currently doing for environmental, environmental farming. It's, a, it's very much a reactive manner. I want to, I want to introduce you all, I want to recommend you all something. We want in partnership with a popular production house down here itself. All right, what we want to do is to capitalize on what we call key opinion leaders. Key opinion leaders are basically influencers. Influencers are basically people with lots of followers and they go around and they believe what the influencers say. And how fantastic can you be if, let's say, with smart farming, all right, across your area down here itself on a farm, you have smart farming. You have an influencer walking along down there on a particular uh, location, say, for instance, in uh, Lahadato or even in Tawau for that matter itself. He or she walks around down there, okay? He or she talks about smart farming. But what is more interesting down here is that it actually, by looking at it down here itself, with the fresh air along down here, with a positive outlook from the influencers itself, and talking about vegetables, it's not just the vegetable, it's the whole environment down here whereby people look at it and say that I am so attracted to the scenery where the, influencing, uh, the influencer is. And what much better to make it more complete is to have Mount Kinabalu as a backdrop of it. That is what we call a cherry on top of your delicious ice cream or whatever. So this, it really, really helps in a way. So we are promoting it in various different ways, right? We are doing it with a production house down here itself. You want to make it professional. 
we want to attract a number of people to come to Sabah. Number one, it helps in smart farming in, in terms of the awareness and the movement of healthy living in Sabah. We want to increase tourism. We want to include what we call ecotourism. And for that matter itself, even for those in property development, people who actually develop or build houses or apartments for that matter itself, nothing that nothing was nothing stops you for even putting a what we call a residential farm by just putting that alone the idea of putting that alone all right a residential iot farm itself run by say for instance the joint management body all right will basically increase the value of their uh the the uh, the, the property that they are actually living down there itself there's so much there's so much positivity that i think we put down here but what we need to do is to take a step back and say that, should I just put my foot forward and just consider this for a while, maybe even on a small scale basis itself and see how we go? My answer to you is that, please, I will also encourage you to actually do that. And once all this moving on itself, all right, influencers will come in, influencers will come and they start talking to you about all this. How can we actually make this better? The question is, how can we make this better for Sabah? That is the most important question that all of us have to answer. Likewise, I will replicate this whole thing over to even other countries such as Vietnam, Cambodia for that matter, because they are also heavily into agricultural uh, farming. Now, uh, one of the things down here that I want to show you all is this particular Chinese girl in China. What she does is that in this YouTube video, she goes to her garden patch down here itself, she takes up a piece of garden, all right, a piece of vegetable down here itself. She cleans it. She goes back to her kitchen in a, more or less like a very kampong way of how a kitchen looks like itself. Without saying any word down here itself, she goes ahead to chop off the, to, to chop the, the vegetables down here, clean it again, cook it for her mom and herself to eat, either for lunch or for dinner or what's the matter itself. And just for that alone, all right, she has actually reached 10 million subscribers. 10 million. How fantastic. That is like one third of the population of Malaysia, right? With a revenue of generated revenue of 11.4 million US dollars. I'm going to stop for a while and let you all think. Is this possible? Certainly it's possible. Certainly, certainly it's possible. And I would I am absolutely convinced that Sabahans will be able to actually do this. So take a look at this down here itself. Social media is big, all right? It is not something that you actually put around in terms of putting your food, uh, a photograph of your food, your children, all right? Your houses or whatsoever into Facebook, YouTube, Yahoo, or whatsoever itself. It is something that I would encourage everybody to leverage upon, all right? In the smart farming uh, and using data and technology itself to ensure that this thing is done properly. So this is, the end of my slide down here itself, a key takeaway, complementing farming method is not to take away or to replace, but it's to complement, right? We achieve eco-sustainability. We embrace technology. We try to reduce traditional operational costs such as fertilizer, all right, uh, pesticides, right? We actually introduce aqua and agri-farming together with them and using key opinion leaders as a catalyst to promote aquaphonic hydroponics in Sabah. But if, if I were to show you this and take you a few slides back about the setup of the IoT aquaponics, one of the little things that you probably may have missed out is basically the fishes, which I rarely mentioned. It is without the fishes, all right, that your waste will come out and actually neutralize and fertilize the plants down here itself. So at the end, to your farmers over there itself, let the fish work for you, right? And for that, my name is Eddie Lowe, Project Director of V1 Solutions. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Mr. Eddie Lowe, for the informative presentation. So, how interesting is that, isn't it? So, I guess now you can grow your vegetable using the aquaponic, wherever you want, but with the help of IoT and technology. Everything is possible with technology. Am I correct, Mr. Eddie? Certainly, certainly. I think one yeah. of the things down here is that uh, 
Let us see what is it that you have in your mind. All right, let us come over and talk to you. And uh, if we need to have a Zoom call, all right, uh, uh, by all means, uh, let us know how we can actually reach you and uh, we can actually take it up from there. All right, okay, thank you. Let's move to the next. Okay, uh, I would like to take this opportunity tell you all uh, about the, our skills training uh, with the leading change and innovation for 21st century leaders. This is, this is program five from V1 Solution. This is to enhance customer focus, creativity, problem solving, and decision making innovation. So, this program will be held on uh, uh, from September, October, November, and December 2021 with the minimal fees of RM500 only. Bear in mind, this is a three days online program. Three days online, you will get as much as uh, information for the smart farming technology. Okay, so um, I guess uh, we okay we move to the next agenda, next program of the uh, Q&A session. Okay, so uh, as I can see, there's a few questions here from the chat box. Uh, already forwarded to our speaker. So let's start with Mr. Eddie with the first question. All right, what is the question? Um, there's quite a lot of uh, chat down here itself. So let me just scroll down. Okay, um, there's one, one direct question to me. Yeah. Okay, from uh, Ms. Fatima Abu Bakar from KL. All right. Uh, question is, I, I'm just wondering if the speaker could help me, a layman who used work with Petronas in training, but I would like to start both vertical, hydroponic and aquaponic. Need to know my startup capital for both, please, just for me and neighborhood, and, and neighbor, not for commercial. This I, I don't you. see there's a problem down here itself. We, what we want to do is to actually have uh, a face to face or even a Zoom uh, discussion with Fatima. Fatima, thank you so much for this uh, opportunity to allow us to have a discussion with us. Uh, understand that there is uh, there are different methods of how we actually approach towards uh, aquaponics or even hydroponics for the matter, whether it's vertical or horizontal. Let me give you an example down here itself. Uh, if you don't mind me saying it itself, uh, we have an opportunity to actually look into what we call a senior citizens uh, area. We, we, while we are a technology enabler, enabler, V1 Solutions is a technology enabler, all right? We also have to be uh, aware on the area that you like to set up uh, the uh, hydroponics, uh, aquaponics farming down here itself. Because in the uh, senior citizen area, it is, it is very difficult for the citizen, senior citizens to say, uh, kneel down or squat for that matter itself to tend to their garden. It is not something which is encouraged down here itself. So what we do is that the design and the design of this uh, of the of the aquaponics farm down here will, will be based on who will be managing it itself. So in the case of a senior citizens, we will build it in what we call uh, eye level or something which they are able to actually have access to, all right, easily. Okay. So thank you. Fatima, hopefully uh, my answer will uh, allow us to actually have a more, more detailed discussion with you. Okay. All yeah. right. The next one is from, uh, this is, I guess this is not a question, just an opinion. Very good sharing by Mr. Bay and Ms. Bay and Mr. Eddie. Also to share in Kuala Lumpur. Also, we have some hotel doing rooftop farming already. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, there is another question from Mr. Tom Wong down here. It's a, how is the IoT network coverage in Sabah, Kundasa, and Punjab, Borneo, Sarawak? Mm. Okay. Yeah. Granted that there are a lot of areas, there are small parts, small parts of areas in Sabah, uh, in Sabah itself that is uh, out of uh, connectivity when it comes to uh, transferring of data. The networking itself is not really uh, that uh, impressive for the matter. I have actually done a strategic study for one of the largest oil palm plantation uh, uh, company in Malaysia. They have uh, plantations in Peninsula, 
in Sabah, Sarawak, in Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, as well as in Africa. The fact down here itself, a lot of them, or rather the, the, the recommendation or the suggestion that was given to them is to use satellite. Five years ago, 10 years ago, satellite is very, very expensive. Today, it is so much more affordable. So that is one of the ways that we can actually do it itself. That's one of the things. Another thing down here itself is that, hey, do we really need to have real-time online type of data that we send out itself? The answer is that it may not be, all right? It can be just on a batch basis. So it all comes to the design of how you want data to be transferred. So IoT may be something fanciful itself, but my suggestion or my recommendation down here itself, let's not try to go into the latest technology that's available in the market itself. Let's take something, take a step back, which is more practical in the different kind of farms or whichever uh, location that you are in, all right? Okay. Are there any questions? If I can see. Okay, what else we have here? Francis is uh, Francis Choi, uh, Mr. Francis Choi is asking whether we have any existing projects already deployed. Okay, now one of the things that we have actually done is to prove to ourselves that IoT works. And what better way is to have it in the back of our office. All right, it can be small because we do not have a large uh, piece of land as compared to some of the larger companies down here itself. But what we can actually do is that uh, the viewing is currently uh, unavailable now. However, we are more than happy itself to share with you some of the photos or anything itself to uh, Francis or Mr. Chua. Okay. All right, a uh, question Almost. from Mr. Lim. Mr. Lim says that besides uh, water-based farming, what do you think of smart farming with soil-based farming? This is the question that I've been waiting. The answer, yes, absolutely possible. No problem at all. No problem at all. And the reason why he's doing it is because farmers in Thailand, still in the traditional way of how they actually till the land down here itself, is actually slowly embracing smart farming. Whereas in Singapore, it, because the land is, uh, they have limited uh, 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 land space down here itself, instead of building something which requires a lot of land, they build upwards. So whether it is a smart farming using uh, aquaponics farming itself using a, a vertical way, it is possible, all right? In traditional farming using, taking advantage of IoT, it is also possible, all right? No questions about that. Okay, ID Idris or ID Idris, minimum capital. I can't tell you on that. All right, I can tell. I can't tell you on that itself. But the fact down here is uh, before we have actually started this webinar down here itself, we have given a real thought about how would it cost for people who is interested itself. Uh, it all depends on what is needed down here itself. But what I can tell you that it is super affordable. All right, it's super affordable. So let's take a step back into the technology uh, uh, technology investment down here. Technology investment is from, uh, uh, in, in, say for instance, even, even until today. It is for you to actually buy a server, all right, buy computers, this and that, everything else. Let's put all this away because we have a different approach of this. Let's take a look on a subscription basis. For example, a subscription basis whereby you don't really have to actually invest so much on technology. Let us take care of the technology down here itself. Okay, Francis is asking, what is the challenge of aquaponics compared to hydroponics? Yeah. Uh, one of the challenges down here that I can think of, all right, is how do we take care of the fishes? Because fish, fish basically uh, is something they have, they have mood. Let me tell you this, they have moods down here itself. Healthy fish down here requires healthy feed. And it's not just the feed that we actually put it into the fishes down here itself. We also have to take care of the pH level of the water. We also have to make sure that what are the water plants that we have to put it down here itself. Now, this is something that farmers probably need some time to understand. All right, pH and the alkalinity or the acidity of water is all dependent on the kind of fisheries that you put inside there. That is something that we have to advise people who want to go into aquaponics.
question from Mr. Gunalan Shamugam. Uh, will livestock sector also will have integration of smart farming? Of course. The answer is yes. All right. Livestock is a different approach altogether itself. The fact down here is that live, livestock is a totally different approach compared to, to uh, uh, fresh produce. And the reason why is because there are a lot more factors that have to put in. And what are the things that we have to put in down here? Not just something that is uh, taken away from the vegetables, which is diseases, but I'm sure that there is a higher risk of livestock uh, catching disease and so on. So at the end of the day, all right, what we want to do down here is to ensure that the IoT, down, the IoT technology we put down here is able to actually detect, detect in a, as simple as just in the change of a temperature in the area, all right, and, and so on. Okay. Fazri, is there any more questions or we can actually take it offline down here itself? Yeah, yeah. I think I think that's that's all the question. But any additional question you can ask through info at v1solution.com. You can drop an email and our secretary will answer your question. Okay? All right. And then uh, I think now it's 11.35. Okay? Can we end our program? Okay. Yes, indeed. Thank you very uh, much, everyone, for st uh, staying with us. Thank you so much. Okay, as you can see on the screen, uh, if you have any question, yeah, you can drop an email to info at v1solution.com. Eh? Later, uh, our schedule will paste the link inside the chat box. Or, and I would like, all of you to please fill up the feedback form. Eh? And okay, all right. Okay, later the secret will put it inside the chat box. Eh? Okay, so I think that's the end of our webinar session on exploring the future of technology farming. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank to thank to our distinguished speaker, Ms. Lydia Bay, Mr. Eddie Lowe, for interesting presentation on the technology-based smart farming. You have to remember the key point. Everything is possible with technology. Okay? Bear in mind. Yeah? Uh, until we meet again in other program, hope have a productive day stay safe stay productive uh what else uh please take care of yourself okay don't go up so often <laughs> it's dangerous so whenever you can do you can attend an online program please please join the online program no need to go out unless it is necessary okay with that note, I would like to end this session. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera. Salam Sabah Produktif, Sabah Maju. Thank you, everyone.